to talk about his cover story in the Atlantic Monthly, which I hope I can find as I'm <laughs> and introducing you. It is called The Fall of the House of Saud. In it, you write, Saudi Arabia is a mess and it is our mess. Would you explain why? You know, since the first meeting between Roosevelt, King Abdulaziz, there was a strategic relationship set up and Saudi Arabia would provide us with oil and they'd buy our weapons. Um, over the years, these frictions have built up and these inconsistencies, which really hit bottom in 1990, 1991 during the Gulf War, when Saudi Arabia was asked to pay for the Gulf War, um, which threw Saudi Arabia into a serious budget deficit. It spawned bin Laden in 1991, demanding American troops leave. It also accelerated Islamic fundamentalism to the point that Saudi Arabia has become, in effect, the people at least, or certain people in Saudi Arabia, an enemy of the United States. We've seen this by pulling the bases out, or are going to be asked to be pulled out this year. Um, it's all these factors coming together that Saudi Arabia is no longer the reliable oil supplier we once thought it was. In addition to that, there's no leader of Saudi Arabia. The king, King Fahed, is incapacitated by stroke. There's a succession struggle going on. And we just don't know where it's going to go today. The front page stories today, which you just referred to, that the U.S. has announced that it's going to be withdrawing combat units from Saudi Arabia. First of all, about how many people are we talking about? About 5,000, I think. It's not a lot, but it's, it's more symbolic than it is the number of troops. What will the effect be on the Saudi government of this decision? Well, I think the, the royal family is going to go to the Saudi people and say, look, relations are not good with the United States. Uh, we've asked them to leave as you want them to leave. And they're hoping things will get better. Um, I doubt that they will. In some of the stories today, it says uh, they, Donald Rumsfeld on his trip there is linking this decision with, again, the emphasis on democratic reforms. Uh, what is the Bush administration's view of what constitutes democratic reforms versus the royal families? They don't want democratic reforms. I mean, I, there are certain polls out there, and I think they're fairly reliable, that and one was done in October 2001, after the 9-11 tax. It said if, if bin Laden ran for election, he'd probably win in Saudi Arabia. Do we want democracy there now? I don't think so. So then will the U.S. really be pus pushing for democratic reforms as it says it will? I wouldn't. It doesn't um, make strategic sense. In, in addition, this war on Iraq has done serious damage to our relations with Saudi Arabia. Um, we have disenfranchised the Sunni minority in Iraq effectively. We've seen this with the shootings in Fallujah uh, today and yesterday. And, you know, I just came from Iraq, and a lot of these Iraqi Sunni are related to the royal family in Saudi Arabia by marriage or directly, and they're, they're upset about it. It's a complex story, and we're going to spend a little more time talking about it before we go to calls, but I want to put the phone numbers on the screen. So if you'd like to take part either by offering an opinion or asking a question of Robert Baer, you are most welcome to do so. If you generally support the president and his policy in the Middle East, 202-585-3880 is the number to reach us. If you uh, generally oppose the president's policies there, the number to reach to Robert Baer is 202-585-3881, and we'll go to calls in just a couple of minutes. You need to, to spend some time on the oil equation because you lay it out uh, pretty thoroughly and how vulnerable it really is. Would you tell us what folks need to know about it? Here's the problem. Saudi Arabia possesses 25 percent of the world's proven reserves. Um, Saudi Arabia has a very advanced um, upstream and downstream capabilities, which is all concentrated in a few areas in eastern Saudi Arabia. If we can extrapolate from the attacks on September 11th, in which 15 Saudis participated in them, and we take this, this discontent with the royal family in the United States, and say what would happen, and this is my thesis in the article, if either the regime or individual Saudis attacked the oil industry, what damage could they do? Uh, the engineers tell me, and I'm not an engineer by the way, that if you sabotaged Saudi Arabia's oil facilities, you could take out six million barrels very easily with a limited amount of explosives. Uh, this is the worst case scenario. Um, there's been some problems in the Saudi oil company, the Ramco security problems. Are we at this stage yet? I don't know. That's why Saudi Arabia bears watching to see how bad things are. So what happens to the United States? 
you take 25 percent of the world's reserves off the market for a year, year and a half, um, we get hit badly. What are the econometrics? Will it go to $150 a barrel? As I say, it might in the, in the article. We don't know. That would involve looking at countries like Nigeria, Venezuela, uh, other problems in the Middle East. If there are problems in Saudi Arabia, would they, would they uh, spread to the neighbors? Maybe. Well, mix into this the stories that we've been seeing over the past couple of days about the re revolt by Nigerian oil workers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then today, um, and perhaps you can under help us understand the geopolitics of this, lots of stories such as the front page of the journal about the U.S. Uh, trying to quickly revitalize Iraqi's oil industry. It's going to take too long. I read that article in the Wall Street Journal, and there's a lot of problems. They've been using uh, antiquated equipment. They've been overproducing from certain fields which destroys them, perhaps for the life of the field. Um, so we can't expect Iraq to get up to, let's say, five or six million barrels in a short period. Um, so there's this convergence of worsening relations with Saudi Arabia and the time it's going to take for the Iraqi fields to recover. So to sort of bring this all down to a nutshell, Saudi Arabia, the U.S. is, is overly dependent on Saudi oil right now. Oh, I think we are. Without, without near-term replacements of it. The Saudi government is in a, in a bad state with its own people, and the Saudi oil industry, which supports the government, is vulnerable. I think absolutely. I think this is calling for Saudi Arabia's fall is an old game in the Middle East. People have been talking about this since the 70s. My opinion, you know, having worked in the CIA, and I'm not a Saudi expert, by the way, but what I've seen that the CIA holds, it's worrisome. And it, it bears watching. In this town, we have not watched Saudi Arabia for a long time. We just assumed it would always be there. We assumed that this oil was banked under its sands and would always be available. And I don't think that assumption holds anymore after September 11th. I want to get some calls in, and then uh, we'll come back and talk more about what you found about the size and scope of what's called the royal family in, in Saudi Arabia. Let's begin with Pittsburgh, California. Good morning. You're on the air, caller. Okay, Pittsburgh? Yes. Yes. Um I like to uh, say that uh, Mr. Uh, Bush uh, policy is not so much for the oil as many people try to say it, but against uh, the terrorists that have been supported uh, by Syria, Libya, Iran, etc. And of course, you know, Saudi Arabia has given a lot of uh, uh, money uh, to these uh, uh, terrorists. And uh, I'm, I'm of the uh, opinion that... Uh, uh, a lot of uh, Americans uh, do uh, forget or try to close their eyes to the realities of uh, the world today. Personally, I believe that uh, um, no, we shouldn't go uh, haphazardly attacking uh, any government, but it should, uh, which you draw a line. Uh, when our national interests are uh, um, uh, threatened. Thank you, sir. Oh, I, I agree with that fully. I think, you know, Saudi Arabia's oil is no longer, it has sovereign rights over it. I mean, if Saudi Arabia took its oil off the market, it, the world's economy could be hurt very badly. But of course, We're talking it about a depression. Won't, won't do that. Um, well, I think we should consider taking the oil fields if it does. I think that should be a contingency plan Kissinger looked at it in the 70s. I think that plan is applicable today and should be updated. Under what scenario? Would it be a, a, a deposed government being replaced by the radicals who would close down the market or the government itself? It could even be third generation princes. Remember, we have not, ten we, 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 did, we broke the bargain with Saudi Arabia. And the original bargain called for consulting on all Middle Eastern problems, and especially related to the Palestinian Israeli. So, this, con this condent goes through the royal family, and it goes through the populace, and it could be just a popular revolution, a Wahhabi revolution, if you like, uh, the Muslim brothers, or it could be just a, um, a political revolution conducted but by some princes. Whoever it is, would they be willing to shut down the cash flow? That's the question. Who thought before September 11th that 15 Saudis would commit suicide in the United States attacking civilian targets? I didn't. It came as a surprise to me. I think we should extrapolate from that, as I said, and say, is it possible the Saudis would take it off the market in some very, in some sort of zealotry? And I think it is possible, or we should be taking a closer look at it. Knoxville, Tennessee, good morning for Robert Baer. Uh, yes, good morning, and thanks a lot for C-SPAN. Um, 
I was, uh, as one who's opposed this war, I, I felt like the uh, real agenda of our government has, we haven't been told the truth, and the writings in New American Century dot org and in time magazine and uh on march 31st revealed that you know wolfowitz and pearl whose assistant Se- secretary of defense and cheney and rumsfeld had written for years of, before 9 11 about going into iraq and occupying it and using those bases for u.s domination of the mid-east and they talked bush into doing the war so i'm asking your guests and he and i of course He's a CIA, former CIA man, and I'm asking for an honest answer. Is one of the reasons we went into the Iraq War the fear in our Pentagon that we were going to lose these Saudi Arabian bases? And the, and the, you know the Pentagon announced last week that they're going to have four bases for years in Iraq. So could you comment on that, please? You know, I think that's an outstanding question. Um, I wondered why, you know, I, I worked in Iraq, and, and I was part of a CIA team that was involved in a coup in 95, so I'm not certainly not supportive of Saddam Hussein, but I couldn't figure out the motivations for this, for this war myself. Um, and I was wondering if it had something to do with Saudi Arabia, knowing that we'd be, we'd, we'd be taken out of our bases, bases we've had since the Truman era, um, fears that we may lose Saudi Arabia and lose its oil. Um, and maybe this war on, against Iraq really was a war about Saudi Arabia, but we just felt we couldn't attack Iraq. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a vital question to our economy, Saudi Arabia, what happens to it and what happens in the region. And maybe by putting bases inside Iraq, we're dealing with the Saudi problem. Bricktown, New Jersey, for Robert Bayer. Good morning. Hi. Is that me? You're on. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I ever since 9-11, I've been kind of paranoid about terrorism now. And with this war in Iraq, I do believe that we did have a right to go in there to protect our interests in our lives and our livelihood. And I'm just concerned, though, over now with the Saudi Arabia business on what is being told to us and what is going on really um mr bear i i really am concerned i just don't know what to do don't know what to say <laughs> you i'm know, really confused i'm concerned you know i left the cia in december 1997 and before i left i was interested in saudi arabia i've never sir i've been to saudi arabia a couple times but i've never served there and i said well you know what's going on in this country and so i got into the cia's director of intelligence computers and it wasn't what I found, it's what I didn't find. We stopped looking into Saudi Arabia and what went on there. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of academics that know more about Saudi Arabia than the CIA does. This is not the CIA's fault, it was the fault of the White House over the years. And this is a bipartisan issue that they didn't want the CIA to look into Saudi Arabia and or spy. And you speculate the reason for that is why? Is, is a strategic relationship and it's too important for the CIA to deal with. Keep it in the White House, keep it in the, you know, the K Street lobbyists, let the, you know, corporate America deal with it, let the Department of Energy when it comes to oil and out of the White House. Um, so you, we can't go to the CIA today because it was crippled and say what's going to happen in Saudi Arabia? Maybe it's much worse than we think. What we do know is that the money for September 11th came from Saudi Arabia from individuals, yet there's been no arrests, no material witness arrests, no arrests. Are the Saudis cooperating? I don't think so. We're not allowed to talk to the witnesses. And as I said, there's been no arrest. You know, the cell set up in San Diego was set up with Saudi money, but there's been no arrests or no, nothing we've seen in the press at least that would suggest that we're getting to the bottom of this question. And if, if we can't get to the bottom of terrorism with Saudi Arabia, as we have with Pakistan, which has done a, a great job recently, how much are we missing? Here's a photograph in today's New York Times of Donald Rumsfeld meeting yesterday with Crown Prince Abdullah in Riyadh. And uh, as we look at the photograph, I'm going to use that as a peg for you to talk a little bit more, Mr. Bear, about the Saudi royal family. First, who's in charge? And then would you move on to talk about the larger extension of that and how that separates the population? Well, the problem with Saudi Arabia, let's keep in mind, is not a country. It's a family that owns most of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, Saudi passports say that the, the holder belongs to the Saudi royal family, not that he's a citizen of Saudi Arabia. 
So the way the Saudis look at it is they just take the wealth of the country, and it is enormously wealthy, and apportion it to themselves. And as the family grows, the Saudi royal family, we don't know exactly know how big it is, goes from 30,000 to 60,000, all these princes believe that they deserve the same amount of wealth that their fathers got. So they're taking this, the oil revenues, and they're putting in their pockets. We call it corruption. They call it the way their country works. It's none of our business. Um, you have also a division in the family between Crown Prince Abdallah, who very clearly would like to reform the system. He is supposedly um, the head of state, but there are other princes that contest his authority. The defense minister, the minister of interior, uh, that don't agree with what he's doing. It's, it's an internal affair, but it affects us because of Saudi Arabia's budget deficit. I'm going to get a couple of facts on the table. How large is the country that we call Saudi Arabia, uh, population-wise? Uh, population-wise, you know, we don't know the exact number. Roughly. Well, you got six million immigrants. I think it's about 12 million population. And the, of that 12 million population, you say that the current estimated size of the royal family, those who get special benefits and privileges, is about 30,000 About 30,000. But, I mean, the, ma the major, we, first of all, you know, we also don't know the birth rate. You can hear it's, you know, 3.2 percent, the 3.6 percent. There's, there are no public figures that, that we can deal with, that we can estimate. What we do know is there's one figure thrown out that the per capita income has fallen thousands of dollars over the years since the oil boom. Could you describe the difference in lifestyle for those who are part of the 30,000 official royal family and those who are not? <sighs> you know, it's anecdotal. You know, you, you go to Antibes and you see King Fahad's palace, which he hasn't lived in years. Or you talk about King Fahad when he went to Geneva and was spending millions of dollars a day on his entourage. They were reopening stores. It's, it's a fantastic difference. You know, there are people in Asir province that don't have water, that don't have, um, uh, you know, medicine or anything else like that. And you've got the royal family that has huge palaces, uh, own jet airplanes. Is there a middle class? That's the problem. The middle class is being um, undermined. Because in Saudi Arabia, because it is the royal family which owns the country, if they go into a business that's doing well and they decide to buy it, they simply force the owner to sell it. And he has no choice. Sometimes it's a good price, sometimes it's not. The Saudi middle class is complaining against us because we don't support them, the democracy that we talk about so much. College Park, Maryland. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, C-SPAN. Uh, my question for Mr. Boyle would be, um, now that Saddam is gone and no longer in power, uh, which government in the Middle East region will act as a counterbalancing force against Iran? Because I think Saddam was uh, the only balancing force against Iran in the region there. So I think Iran uh, is the country that most benefited on the removal of Saddam. Um, what do you think about that? Um, I'd like to first say that all these questions are great. <laughs> um, that's, you know, I just came back from Baghdad, and, and, you know, the thing you notice first are the number of tanks that are burnt out. I mean, this is the Iraqi army. This is the shield of the Arab Peninsula. It's gone. Um, What, you know, who is going to protect Saudi Arabia? If the army is not capable of doing it, if the Iranians want to come across the Shad al Arab and attack, um, who, will, yeah, who will protect them? It's a good question, and I don't know. And I think that's a problem because we're going to have to stay in the region to make sure this doesn't happen. Um, this, this looming conflict with Iran poses a very real threat. There's an Iranian terrorist group which has been allowed to stay in Iraq, Mujahideen al Khalq. That's going to infuriate the Iranians. We can expect a reaction from them, some sort of guerrilla warfare. They're going to try in Iraq. And, and the Iranians are also going to hold the Saudis responsible for this, even though they're not. Uh, what do we do? Um, this war, I think, has opened up a can of worms. And it's foolhardy to predict where it's going to go. But we're going to be seeing in the next couple of years. For Robert Baer, who writes in the current Atlantic Monthly, Thermont, Maryland. Hi, my name is Richard Gaver, and I appreciate this time with C-SPAN. Uh, yes, I do uh, think President Bush is doing a great job. I think that uh, it's great that he's pulling out of Saudi Arabia. It's been about time. 
I think that every time he does something good, the Democrats knock him, and I can't understand why they didn't knock uh, Clinton for eight years, especially when Turkey offered to hand over bin Laden in 98, which would have uh, made it so we didn't have all these problems today that Bush has to deal with, and he nonstop gets criticized. Uh, I think that the last year Clinton was in office, the economy started going down, not when George Bush jumped in office. Uh, I thank you for your time, and I appreciate uh, letting me get in this call. Thank you very much. Uh, one point he makes is about the uh, length of time that uh, Osama bin Laden has been a problem. Uh, in, 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 it's true. In 1996, I think it was, um, I think, yeah, um, the, 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 the Saudis were offered bin Laden from Sudan. Uh, they said no. Um, and they were very frank about it. They said he's too popular in Saudi Arabia. If we take him in jail, and we're going to have internal problems. We did, there's no question about it during the Clinton presidency, ignore the problems in the Middle East. On the other hand, when Clinton came in, he said, it's the economy. It's domestic problems I'm going to deal with. And he did exactly what he said he was going to do. In the meantime, as this Islamic fundamentalism problem started in Pakistan and in, in Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia, the administration's only concern was getting bigger contracts. And of course, the famous one is the Boeing contract, which was, I think, $7.2 billion, which further bankrupted Saudi Arabia, <coughs> excuse me, further caused uh, economic problems in the country. And no one was really addressing this, this, this undercurrent of Islamic fundamentalism. And that's why today we see the White House taking extreme measure of attacking Iraq. Uh, if you'd stay with that for just a minute, it, within Saudi Arabia today, what is the power of the religious leaders versus the royal family? That's a difficult one. Um, what we do know for certain is that those 15 Saudis that got on those airplanes were recruited locally. Now, who recruited them, who vetted them, who picked them out for this operation? I, I haven't seen any good um, information on this, but we do know that there are several clerics that have called for a jihad against the United States who are free today. In Saudi Arabia, they're very influential. Uh, they can move about, they can raise money. Um, there's none of them that I know that have been implicated in attacks on September 11th, but without Saudi cooperation, we can't be certain of that. Studio City, California. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Mr. Bear, I've, I've been through the Middle East, and I just cannot believe what Beirut looked like in 1950 when I was about eight years old, nine years old. My parents took us there, and it was gorgeous. In fact, they called it the uh, Pearl of the Middle East. Uh, and then all of the fractions broke out. I mean, it's unbelievable to even take a look at what Beirut looks like. But the tribes, uh, I don't understand how we could get into to Iraq and think that we're going to have democracy. I mean, just take a look at the fanatics that are in there. It's going to take another 400 years before you can't have democracy unless the people want it. And obviously, uh, the democracy is not what we have here in the United States. And it's sad. Egypt's even having problems with their, their uh, fundamentalists. So, I mean, we got a long way to go. Thank you. Oh, I think we do. When I was, I went down to Karbala shortly before these, um, you know, these processions, the Ashura processions were coming up. And... I talked to one of the clerics there, sat down with him on camera. I was working for ABC at the time. And he said, listen, I'm in charge here. This is now, Karbala is a small Islamic city. I run the telephone, I run the security services, I keep the mail going. We don't want the United States here, get out. You know, we, we're, we're, we're faced with a de facto uh, Islamic Republic in the South. And I, you know, I'm glad I'm not in the CIA trying to solve this problem or the State Department telling these people what they're going to do because they're adamantly opposed to our presence there right now. You've made reference a few times to your uh, role in the CIA, but would you talk to us a little bit more deeply about what you did? Um, I, was, I was a case officer, and that what that is, is is a person who goes overseas and is assigned to a country. For instance, I was in Lebanon, I was in Khartoum, I was in Iraq, and I'm dealing with people trying to get the true story of what's going on in the country. It's, we want what we call sources or agents, locals who can tell us things we can't read in the press. 
uh, who can give us secrets, steal documents, whatever you want, which is very is one of the three legs of intelligence service. One is you know public information, one is technical information, and source information. So I would go to a person that I knew had knew something was going on, and ask him to work secretly for the CIA. So you were undercover. As well? I was undercover. Why did you leave? I left. I got involved in. Um, campaign investigating campaign financing scandal and it became this is uh, it was, people sort of forgot it in 97 became and I didn't like the way that CIA handled it um, I, part of it was looking into the files in Saudi Arabia you know if, if the CIA is forbidden from spying on Saudi Arabia do I really want to work there next call for Robert Bears from Andrews Air Force <coughs> Base you're Excuse on me. the air caller hello yes hi my question was, as far as uh, I'm an active military member right now, I kind of support the president's policy uno officially, unofficially have my reservations. But with regard to our pulling out in the bases of Saudi Arabia, what was the thoughts upon that? And when, do you think that would prolong our presence as far as in Iraq and Oman and Qatar and all the other bases that we have? Well, my, my opinion is, and I, I'm a, remind, I remind you I'm an outsider on this, is that we were not, this was not a mutual, a common decision or a mutual decision between us and Saudi Arabia. The Saudi, Arabia's, the Saudi Arabians told us before the war they wanted us out. Uh, Patrick Tyler of the New York Times was told this. He, he did an article on it, and now they've done it. Um, what that tells me is things are so bad in Saudi Arabia, that they're breaking an agreement that's more than 50 years old. Um, how far that will go, I can't tell you. But the Saudis are telling us that our presence there is unacceptable. Rochester Hills, Michigan. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. Thank you for taking my call, C-SPAN. Uh, I have a question for our, your guest. Include, it not only includes Saudi Arabia, but also includes the whole Middle East. Um, when I've been, to, I've been to those areas, and it seems that any kind of a war on terror we're trying to run, or this current war, the, the post-war, the peace of trying to win the peace, as we used to say, in Iraq, actually goes against what, what we are as Americans. I mean, as Americans, we are into production, we're into industrial might, we're into things. And, it seems, and we don't understand as Americans that what we're up against in the whole war, in a war on terror, is up against an idea. I mean, the uniting force through the whole Middle East is Islam. And, you know, despite the fact that we may say we want to bring democracy to Iraq, what we're really looking at is the fact that, you know, I cannot understand, you, that your earlier guest mentioned Rumsfeld, was a big supporter of Rumsfeld. And yet he gets on an international forum and says, we will not allow any kind of a theocracy to come into Iraq which is basically telling the world that, yeah, we're in favor of democracy as long as it's a democracy we like. I mean, I, I have friends in Europe who automatically, within hours, I was getting emails, and I'm amazed at how many people remember Allende, which is, how, what, 20, 30 years ago. And I just wondered if, you know, if, if him, if this gentleman as a CIA operative actually took in the differences in our culture and how we see the world versus their culture and how they see the world. And the fact that we're trying to fight an idea here. I mean, I explained to friends that the, the guys who crashed the airplanes into uh, the Trade Center essentially spent three years planning their own suicides. And they still went through with it. That's some awfully strong ideals. Thank you. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, you know, I, I couldn't have said it better. Bin Laden is an idea. As far as I can tell, Bin Laden's in Pakistan now, if he's still alive sitting in a cave he could disappear forever but it's the idea that he has so well for the muslims brought out and that idea will will continue um you have to remember that that a lot of the middle east was very secular in the 60s until the 67 war and there was this humiliating defeat that israel inflicted on the arabs and as best i can tell I take this trend of jihad and Islamic fundamentalism back to 67. And these people are basically believe that their only out is, is suicide operations, righteous murder. If we go into a country in Iraq and give them democracy, I don't see today that, that um, 
we're going to come out with a democracy we like. And uh, we as Americans, are we going to tell them what kind of democracy they're going to have? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. In the South, the 60% of the Shia look like they're going to vote for some sort of Islamic Republic. Are we going to go in and say no? I don't know. Next telephone call is uh, Arlington, Virginia. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, my question is actually to the uh, to C-SPAN and uh, to the House. Therefore, uh, I don't really see as a person who has traveled around the world. Uh, <coughs> your guest this morning as entitled to talk about uh, the Saudi royal family. He's uh, a CIA operative. So I don't really see any kind of, uh, how can I say, any uh, kind of uh, intellectual credibility for him to talk about the Saudi royal family. Thank you very much. Well, can, I, can you talk a little bit before you go? I'd like to hear your thoughts on the royal family. Um, what gives you the platform to talk about the, the Saudi royal family? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, it's a legitimate question. I mean, the reason I have a voice on the Saudi royal family is because the Saudi royal family doesn't talk about itself, because there's not a free press in Saudi Arabia. If we had a Washington Post and a New York Times that could talk about these questions, or uh, American journalists were allowed to go there and ask these questions, we'd have a much more authoritative voice than mine. I don't claim to be a Saudi expert, so that the fact that Saudi Arabia does not allow freedom of speech leaves the West open to a lot of speculation. In my book, um, which the, this story is based on, I talk about my personal stories and about how difficult it is to get to the truth on Saudi Arabia. Um, I mean, it's, it's a good question, but you know, in the absence of the Saudis talking about themselves honestly, we can only speculate in the West and we just hope our speculation is right. I mean, it's the same way with North Korea. It's a hermit kingdom. Um, and I would certainly appreciate emails from Saudis on this article pointing out where our assumptions are wrong. And these are not my assumptions, by the way. A lot of these are taken from the CIA. What we know about it and the State Department and correcting us. I think we need that dialogue today. How do they find you? The Saudis? You said you want emails on the subject. Uh, you, can, you can email the Atlantic Monthly. And on it is theatlantic.com. Theatlantic.com. Send in, you know, I, there's this big debate in, that I've been going on with certain people about tribal relations in Saudi Arabia. Is the wife of Crown Prince Abdullah a Shamar or is she a Shamar from the Rashid clan? And you know, I talk to, I'm very close to the tribes in the Arab world and you get a hundred different answers. And I said, no, it's a Shalan, she's a Shamar, she's a Rashidi. But anything definitive about Saudi Arabia, I welcome. Well, let's uh, turn to the topic which you talk about in the article in the Atlantic about the Saudi government's, the Saudi royal family's representation here in Washington. It's been in the hands of the same person for a long time. Prince Bondar, he's very effective. He's, he's brilliant. He knows the United States inside and out. He represents his country. He knows how lobby, the lobby, lobby firms on K Street work. Does a great job. And you detail, he also has a pretty open purse. He has open purse. I mean, so do the Israelis. But this isn't an article about Israel. And how does he use the money at his disposal? He uses it very effectively. With what kinds of groups? He hires State Department people. You know, they'd leave, say, listen, we have to have an even-handed uh, view of Saudi Arabia. We've got the right wing, which has become anti-Saudi. And we have to bring the, big, the best face out. He's a great lobbyist. He's a, he's a great ambassador. One of the tactics that you describe is that he takes care of former government officials uh, when they leave office and no longer have power the way, the way this town recognizes it. And that sends a signal to people taking office. According to the Washington Post, he admitted that. Um, I, I haven't seen that retracted by the Washington Post. So it's, <coughs> excuse me, it's not my idea. Um, and he does. If you know that if you're in this town and you're a Middle East expert and it's time to retire, you can't retire on a State Department salary or a White House salary alone. So you go work as a lawyer or a lobbyist for Saudi Arabia and they take good care of you. Indianapolis. Yes, uh, I'm calling primarily to uh, give some information I heard in the middle of the night last night as I was flipping through the channels, both the C-SPAN and your audience. Uh, as I was flipping through, I recognized a man that I've read many of his books named Grant Jeffrey. 
uh, you know, we he he's a um, man who documents the uh, reliability of the scriptures and delves into prophecy. And we all have very partial knowledge on which we are trying to guess the future. And in talking on this program last night, which will be aired again through the day for anybody who knows what Grant Jeffrey looks like, and he's written the book, The Handwriting of God, and anybody can check that out. It has the, the kind of information in it that I'm going to tell you. He claims that through his intelligence sources, he knows that there are 341 uh, uh, people from um, Saddam's regime that went to Syria, named the hotel that they're in. Now, if he knows that, either our government knows that, or they will know it, because I'm sure he'll be in touch with it. But I thought that was interesting information, and I'd like to point out that God is really the only one that sees the whole big picture. We cannot anticipate what's going to happen, uh, though it's certainly interesting to try. But the prophecies do tell us there will be a peace treaty, therefore everything can't go too bad. That's in Daniel 9:27. And we know that the uh, Jews are going to rebuild their temple. That's in Scripture. So uh, we also know that that uh, peace treaty isn't going to bring everlasting peace. We don't know how long it's going to last, but we do know some of the things that are going to happen in the future, and I recommend that we read the Scriptures and put that, enter that into our equation of trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future. Thank you. We certainly... I, I think that's a good answer to the last question. There's a lot of things we don't know about the way this is all going, but the Middle East is um, going to be a very interesting place for a long time. Another part of the equation in the relationship between Saudi Arabia and the United States, which you mentioned, and we get lots of calls from people about this, is the Carlisle Group. <laughs> I, I just saw a letter from the Carlisle Group. Look, the, the Carlisle Group is, does leverage buyouts. Um, a lot of the money they seek for these buyouts, Al Walid bin Talal and the rest of them come from Saudi Arabia. It's a good place to tap funds. Does that make the Carlisle Group responsible for what happened in Saudi Arabia? No. I mean, they're just they're part of the system and they're very successful. We as Americans are responsible for Saudi Arabia. I call it a consent of silence. We just don't want to talk about it. Um, there, there's no conspiracy here. It doesn't have to be. It's just it's it's easy money. It's oil we depend on. Saudi Arabia has done our bidding for all these years successfully. It's been a very profitable relationship for the person who drives his car to work to the Carlisle Group. I only mention the Carlisle Group because it's, it's become a symbol or a metaphor for the relationship with Saudi Arabia. In what way? Um, government officials leaving. Carlucci, which headed the group, James Baker, the Bush family. Um, is, is connected with this. John Major, who was responsible for all sorts of deals when he was Prime Minister of Britain, is head of Carlisle Europe. And even a few uh, Clinton administration folks, such it's as... It's bipartisan. Bocanard. Washington's an expensive town to live in, you know. There was one name that caught my attention I just had to ask you about. Uh, Afsana, uh, and I'm not going to mispronounce her middle name, Beschloss. Uh -huh. The Beschloss is a familiar name. Is there any relationship there to Michael Beschloss, the historian? I think so, yes. Do you know what the relationship is? No. <laughs> Miami is next. Hi. Have you ever read the book Firewall, the Iran-Contra Conspiracy and Cover-Up by Lawrence Walsh, the Independent Counsel? Yes, I did read it. In fact, I used it for my, my previous book. This is fascinating reading, and it's very apropos of what you're saying right now, especially when it comes to Prince Bandar on play, page 353. It says, Prince Bander, the Saudi ambassador, had visited Casper Weinberger in his office on Sunday to let him know that Nancy Reagan had said that she thought Schultz should go because he had been disloyal to the president. I don't want to read the rest of the paragraph because I don't want to take up too much time, but I want to go on to where he says, shocked as we were to read the Saudi ambassador's maneuvering to select our Secretary of State, we were more interested in Weinberger's notes concerning the November 24th White House meeting in which Meese had outlined the false story to be used to cover up Prince President Reagan's illegal authorization of the November 85 Hawk sh sh shipment. Now, Bush always said, Bush when he was out of the loop. If you read the book, you know he was in these meetings, and Reagan had sent him overseas to 
deliver money. We were taking a million dollars a month from Saudi Arabia to help hide out the fact that we were trading um, hostages for um, weapons. And Saudi Arabia was contributing, right? That's exactly my point. I mean, Saudi Arabia was not happy about this connection with Iran. Let's get that straight. This was not its policy. It was the Reagan administration's policy to get the hostages out. Um, and to, to open up some sort of channel to Iran. But the point is, and this lady is exactly correct, is Saudi Arabia was there to help us on Iran-Contra. I mean, they've, they are paying the price today, um, and I mentioned in my book, but it's that kind of easy money that's made this relationship poisonous. I mean, it's, it's, look, at, look at it from the Saudi point of view. They're saying, you know, we've done this for you all these years, and now you're ungrateful. Now we're being attacked. Um, we paid for the first Gulf War, I think it was $40 billion is a figure used. What have you done for us? I mean, we didn't get to vote on the Iraq War. You went ahead, you forced it on us. Uh, what have you done to solve the Palestinian problem? You know, the Bush administration. So there, there's, there's both sides to this argument. What I say, it's just an unhealthy relationship. And going back to Iran Contra, it, Saudi Arabia facilitated it at the behest of the White House. But just to that point, the Saudi government, you say the, you, the Iraq war, the first Iraq war was forced upon them. No, 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 no I'm sorry, the second, the, second. War, the second war was forced upon them. Okay. Next is a call from uh, Chicago. Chicago, you're on the air. Welcome. Hello. Um, my name is Pierre, and I uh, worked in Saudi for a while, and I wanted to ask uh, the gentleman, first I wanted to thank, thank C-SPAN and uh, Mr. Baer to address a very important problem for the USA. I wanted to ask Mr. Baer whether he thinks the United States should take sides in the feud, uh, in the family feud uh, now prevailing in Saudi Arabia, and if he does, which side do you think we should be on? Caller, can you tell us a little bit more? When were you in Saudi Arabia? Well, I've uh, uh, been a subcontractor for uh, 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 many years, uh, from 1982 till very recently. Till very recently. Can you give us your own perception, since you were on the ground working in a, a legitimate business role, about some of the uh, disparity in the society as Mr. Baer has described? Well, Mr. Baer is right on the money, uh, and that disparity uh, was in the, in the 80s not as obvious as it has been recently. Uh, recently, that disparity has uh, produced a lot of discontent among the middle class in Saudi Arabia. And uh, I see uh, the more, uh, the, uh, very recently, I have uh, watched uh, the, the, the growing discontent against the royal family in Saudi Arabia. But uh, at the same time, there is a popularity that is also growing for. Uh, uh, the, or, 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 or the crown prince, uh, Prince Abdullah. I'd like Mr. Baer's opinion on that. Thank you. I, I would, uh, frankly, my personal preferences from Abdullah, what I've seen his attempts to reform the kingdom are, are, are honest. This is not just a power struggle. He's worried about deals like the Boeing deal, where the money's going. He's worried about the foreign workers coming in. He's worried about young Saudis. Who, are, who can't find jobs, who go to the mosque instead. Um, the Suderi, which is another part of the royal family, are more concerned about the traditional relationships with the West, military contracts, construction contracts, um, and they're fighting Abdallah. This is very clear. Um, you know, seeing what I've seen is very clear. There's this opposition. Um, His first question is whether or not the United States government should pick sides. I think they should pick sides. I mean, there's a tendency in the right wing in the United States to pick sides with the Sidere because Abdullah is pushing hard for a peace treaty between the Palestinians and the Israelis uh, that would be based on Resolution 242, which many Israelis don't want to accept, or at least in some present interpretation. Um, I think we'd be a lot better off with Abdullah in the long run, but. Um, Robert Barrow will be with us till the top of the hour, about 10 more minutes. We uh, invited him in because of his cover story in The Atlantic. And you also say it's accepted from, excerpted from uh, your latest book, which is called what? And where is it available? S sleeping with the Devil, and it's going to come out with Crown in July. 
in July. And there's uh, another Robert Bear title in the bookstores and in libraries. It's called See No Evil, the true story of a ground soldier in the CIA's war on terrorism. Next call for him is from Lansdale, Pennsylvania. Good morning. Oh, hi. Uh, sleeping with the devil. That's a, that's a good lead into my question here. Uh, Fifteen of the 19 hijackers were supposedly from Saudi Arabia, yet we attacked Afghanistan and then Iraq. Could you please talk about the deep connections between the Bush family and the Bin Laden family? Thank you. Um, the, the Bin Laden family is, as you know, into construction. They're doing the Mecca Mosque reconstruction project. And what they've done is over the years, and there's a lot of companies, and it's not, I don't want to focus on the Carlisle Group, that's done business with them. They make a lot of money, they raise a lot of money, they pay a lot of money to the commissions to the royal family. The Bush family is very close to Saudi Arabia. The Bush family has been into oil and energy for a long time. They know that Saudi Arabia is key to the industry. And the tentacles of this relationship are very complicated. You know, you have the president going to visit Bondar and his estate in Britain. Uh, you have Bondar's family taking care of the Bush family. Um, these interconnecting commercial relationships. There's a lot of interpretations of them, but they're very close. Next call is from Creflo, Tennessee. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. That's, sure. Uh, that's Creflo, Tennessee. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for taking my call. I appreciate that. I was going to ask your guest who... Uh, speculate on the uh, level of information we have on the uh, Middle East in the 70s versus now and more specifically does the uh, does the government and media really acknowledge the number of undead in Baghdad and the spread thereof and what uh, what final solution is provided by that phone number that's on the crate in uh, in uh, dealing with the zombies uh, I'd you know I'd, I w I was a former intelligence officer and you can never have enough information it can never be good enough but I don't think it's very good. I think we were surprised by the resistance in the South during the initial week of the war. And I think we were even more surprised that Baghdad fell so easily within an hour, basically. I mean, look at Janine in Palestine. It took him 14 days to take it. Baghdad was basically an hour. Saddam's army deserted. Um, we didn't know that. Um, There's a lot of criticism from the generals. There's a lot of um, you know, criticism in the press about the initial losses. Um, as the, the, the Middle East becomes more difficult, or more, you know, more, there's more tensions rise, it's more difficult to get information, especially in a country like Iraq pre-invasion. We really didn't know what was going on there. We didn't know where the weapons of mass destruction were. Um, and I can say the same about Saudi Arabia. We don't know enough to predict where this is going precisely. We just know there's problems. Now, he structured his question to compare the level of information we have now with the 70s. Was there an earlier time when we had more information about the region? We did much better in the 70s. Um, I've got a lot of former colleagues that knew the royal family, could see the king in the 70s, uh, could see anybody they wanted in Saudi Arabia, stayed at their houses in southern France, um, knew them, dealt with them, exchanged ideas. Today, I, I see a lot less of that. Why, do you think? The Saudis are mistrustful of the United States. Um, the CIA's relationship with Saudi Arabia wasn't as important to the Saudis. They could bypass the CIA and go directly to the K Street lobbyists. They could go to the Secretary of State directly as they became more, more important for American policy. Next telephone call is from Portland, Oregon. Yeah, hi, good morning. Thanks for taking my call. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Mr. Bear, I was really interested in your comment that the CIA is out of the loop. Uh, I worked in Saudi Arabia from 1978 to 1980. I was with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, <clears throat> and we were working on a military construction project called the King Khalid Military City, mm -hmm. which is quite far up north, <clears throat> near the border. And... Um, it has a very distinctive footprint. Are you familiar with that footprint? Yes. Well, uh, after we uh, conquered or captured uh, some of bin Laden's camps in Afghanistan, I saw that same footprint in the hands of uh, Christiane Amanpour. She was looking through a terrorist notebook and had the basic footprint of King Khalid Military City 
in her hand. She thought it was a building, but I recognized it as a city. What This gave me a headache and a nightmare. I called the FBI and asked them to look into it. They never called me back. But I began, my nightmare began with the concept that if bin Laden was interested in King Khalid Military City, which is highly armed, um, is it possible that he wanted to capture or conquer <laughs> a Saudi city and then turn it against everybody on Earth? I was wondering um, what it would mean uh, to the United States if something like that fell into his hands. Your Th comment, please. That's precisely my, my worry, is that, that, that a lot of Arabs and Islamic fundamentalists believe that Palestine can be liberated through Riyadh. You make the Saudi royal family fall, put pressure on the United States, uh, oil embargo, the United States will be forced to force Israel to make a peace treaty acceptable to the Palestinians. I think that, that, that bin Laden's ultimate goal is to take Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's fantastic. It's not going to happen. But that's what he would really like to do, is put it in the hands of the fundamentalist, non-royal family, um, sell oil at a very high price, price that he thinks is much too low. I think he's, it's one point said $144 a barrel. Um, and by attacking the United States, he was hoping to achieve his goal in Saudi Arabia. I mean, it was, he was obviously wrong. We've, we've had the opposite reactions. Americans reacted to it. Um, I don't accept the argument that militant Islamic fundamentalists hate the United States. They just want us out of the Middle East. If we want to lead a sinful life in their eyes, fine, go do it in the United States. Just don't bring it to our country. Um, and I think that's really what bin Laden is about, is getting the United States out of Saudi Arabia, changing the royal family, or making it closer to his views. About five minutes left in our hour with Robert Baer. Next call is from West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, good morning. Thank you for calling, uh, taking my phone call. Um, the question is that, uh, to Mr. Baer, uh, 17 out of uh, 19, 21 um, uh, terrorists from Saudi Arabia. And uh, my question is that, uh, and they are the ones uh, Saudi Arabia is the main uh, country that is exporting fundamentalist and uh, Islamic studies, which is called Wahhabi system, or Wahhabi studies. Would you uh, um, give me some comments on that, please? Uh, I, it's true that, that I'm, I'm curious how these 15 Saudis found their way on those airplanes. Uh, some of them had never lived in Europe. Some of them had been to Afghanistan. Some of them hadn't. Who recruited them under a system where the mosques are run by the state? Um, was it an accident that these 15 found their way under the, on those airplanes, or was it, is it a larger movement? Again, I go back to my comments that one gentleman had called in, is if the Saudis don't tell us what's happening in their own country, we can only speculate. We can only speculate how bad it is. Um, it's like reading tea leaves in Saudi Arabia. But from what I've seen, and especially the requests we pull out of Saudi Arabia, things are not good. Your article on the Atlantic Monthly lays out a very complex situation. Doesn't propose any solutions. Does your book, and do you? Um, my, my book does propose solutions. Middle East settlement, pulling our bases out of Saudi Arabia, and an understanding that any government in Riyadh has got to export oil and maintain a stable market. Short of that, we may be forced to go to war to secure those fields, as radical as it seems. But I just don't see how this country could survive on oil at $100 or $150 a barrel. Los Angeles. Yes, hi, I have a call for Mr. Bear. My first, the first part of my question, I'll make this quick, is um, as you just stated, um, since we are pulling out of Saudi Arabia, the situation does not look good. Um, I thought perhaps it was um, getting better since we are choosing to leave and maybe quelling some of the tensions. Um, my question is, since we are pulling out, does this have anything to do with some of the concerns around Iraq trading in petrodollars and the U.S. wanting to break up the OPEC situation and to really gain a foothold in that area? I think that Iraq is, is really the as we close down Saudi Arabia and open bases in Doha and Iraq, which we appear to be doing, we are, 
We are, re we are recalibrating our policy in the Middle East. And it looks like we're going to be much more wary of Saudi Arabia in the future. And I think that the administration at the same time knows this is going to help the Saudi royal family by not having troops there, which is an irritant to the militant fundamentalists. Tomorrow morning from 9 to 10 Eastern Time on the Washington Journal, there'll be a special focus on the Air Force post-Iraqi war. James Roche, who is the Secretary of the Air Force, and General John Jumper, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, will be at the table uh, to talk about lessons learned and uh, the future for the Air Force uh, from uh, the combat it engaged in there. Sebastian, Florida, for Robert Baer. Welcome. <coughs> Hello. Good morning, sir. Hi. Yes. Good morning, Susan. I got true to you from 92 to 96. I finally got through in 96. Oh, well. Third time I've got through in 11 years. Wow. <laughs> I only call you or Brian, say, so you're both very popular. I'm fascinated by Mr. Bear's comments. i just like to correct him on one thing, which I think was an innocent mistake. Uh, he talked about uh, Iran-Contra in association with the hostages with uh, President uh, Reagan. Uh, if he remembers the day of the inauguration, the people were on a plane leaving Saudi Arabia, or leaving Iran, rather, and uh, heading back to Germany and come home. So one thing had nothing to do with the other. I've had a lot of experience in Saudi Arabia, but not in the 90s, and so I retired from my business with cancer. Um, are you, I did are have, you, what I did, I, I did work for Prince Ben Jalloway. Do you remember who Prince Ben Jalloway was, Mr. Bear? No. He was the governor general of the Eastern Province. There are 4,000 princes in <coughs> Saudi Arabia, but uh, I'd say second in command would be the governor general, who was replaced in 1991 by uh, Prince Bandar. Can I ask uh, you a question, sir? Sure. Yes, uh, sir. Based on your experience, I'm sure you still follow uh, the situation there. Uh, what do you think of the current state of relations between the two countries, and where should it go? I, I'm not surprised about it at all. <clears throat> There's so much wealth in the hands of so few. And uh, in my experience, uh, the workers there, just like they were in Kuwait, were the Palestinians and were smart people. Uh, the one man that was the retainer for uh, the prince and for his son, this man had eight daughters, I believe, and one, one son. Now our time's running out, unfortunately. Sure. Well, uh, well <coughs> uh, they, <coughs> they uh, kept the, they, he was the head of the Bedouins, and that was the important thing. The Bedouins were the fighters. There are seven tribes, seven countries comprise Saudi Arabia. We, ha we do have to go. I apologize for asking you a complex question and then not having any time. Robert Baer, our guest, and I appreciate you being at the table for a full hour with us. Pick up the magazine. It's on newsstands now, The Fall of the House of Saud, and look for Robert Baer's new book in July. Thank you for being Thank you. Here.